of Jesus is that he is our bridegroom and how we relate to that title, of course, is that we are the bride, that's what the church is called, the bride of Christ. The word often refers to the kingdom of heaven as a wedding, as a marriage. It happens quite a bit. The reason for the redemption story we enjoy was to redeem a bride for the son. That's what the cross was for, right? The bride, the church, is the bride of Christ, he being the bridegroom. Check out um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Wow. Wow. That's like a, that's like a long bath. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, look at verse 31. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. What mystery? The mystery that a husband and a wife in this miracle of marriage would become one flesh. It's a mystery and it's profound. And Paul says, I am saying that it, marriage, earthly marriage, refers to Christ and the church. It refers to actually Christ and the church. The two Totally different entities becoming one is a mystery. A mystery that illustrates this earthly uh, marriage idea illustrates or points to the mystery of something greater, something more, and that mystery is Jesus and his bride, the church. Paul says, yeah, you see this husband and wife, this earthly thing that's going on? It's a mystery, but it is there. Earthly marriage was designed as a practical, tangible example of something bigger, something more, a model of something so much more profound than what it looks like, and that is Jesus and you. That's amazing. Paul's like, it's a mystery, you guys. It's a mystery. In fact, Jesus' first miracle, his very first miracle on earth was at a wedding. It was at a wedding. He chose a wedding. His mom kind of nudged him along, but he's God and no one nudges God. He chose a wedding. It was super important. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So the first century Jewish wedding ceremonies and customs are amazing in their parallels. It really is kind of jaw-dropping. And if you've never been through the Jewish wedding, or even if you have, every time I do this, I was like, wow, I've done it like a hundred times. It's really cool. The Jewish wedding customs are secular customs, secular traditions. We have traditions here in the U.S. how we do weddings, usually with a price tag of 25 grand or something. That's our tradition or whatever it is. Um, we have customs too that we do. Well, the Jewish people also had customs and they're just secular customs, of course, but ones that model crazy model parallel the gospel and the kingdom perfectly coincidence probably not i think the lord had a hand in it so though they are secular customs you can see the fingerprint of the lord on it and jesus 
nods back to the Jewish customs a lot. So tonight we're going to go through a ton of scripture and I'm going to show you the times where he says, you know how it goes. Remember the wedding? Remember these traditions? And he's always point, pointing back to it. Um, would I make a doctrinal um, statement or stance based on secular wedding traditions? No. Okay? They're not in the Bible. I would not do that. But I do see the Lord in it. And he is constantly drawing on things to teach us about the kingdom, to teach his disciples about the kingdom of something that's familiar to them, like wheat and rocks and fish. We see him doing it all the time. Hey, you see that rock? You see that lily? You see that sheep? You see that child? He's always pointing at earthly physical things to teach us about the kingdom and he does the same thing with Jewish wedding customs he's pointing at something physical secular and drawing a parallel to the kingdom um, I believe he used the wedding as these teachable moments something that the first century here would immediately pick up on Okay, so these parallels are really hard to ignore, mostly because they came out of Jesus' mouth in red letters. <laughs> that makes it really hard to just dismiss offhand. So tonight, because we are in heaven, and we just met our bridegroom, and we exchanged gifts, we are now in that seven-year honeymoon period, which is the same seven years of what's going on on earth. The tribulation, right? So that seven-year time in heaven is um, important to what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to walk through a Jewish wedding from beginning to end. And I'm going to show you some of these parallels. So, first of all, the Jewish wedding. The Jewish wedding had three phases. That's something different than America. America has two phases. We have an engagement and we have a wedding, right? You get engaged and then you get married. Well, in the Jewish customs, they have three phases, engagement, betrothal, wedding. That's how it went. So first, the engagement. What happens at the engagement phase of a wedding? Well, Number one, very first thing that happens is that the father chooses the bride for the son. The father of the son chooses a bride for the son. And oftentimes in first century Middle Eastern cultures, that bride was chosen before she was even born or before the mother of the bride was even pregnant. Okay, so what happens is in that time, like let's just say Nazareth, okay, that's a small little village town in Jesus' day, of course, because Jesus lived in what town? Nazareth, okay. So these little village towns, um, when, when the Bible says they went to Nazareth or they went to Bethany, we think, okay, they're going to Central Point in Medford and Ashland. No, you're talking like 50 to 100 people lived in these little tiny communities. You know the entire nation of Israel is the size of our New Jersey? It's tiny. You can walk the entire thing in like a month or something. Okay, so these little al alcoves of villages. So Nazareth, for instance, had somewhere between 100 and 200 people, they think, living there at the time of Jesus. It was actually a little bit bigger one, but that is it. I mean, we have Bible studies that big sometimes. So think about that. People knew each other really well. <laughs> you only have to know 100 people. You know what I'm saying? Okay, and so these families would know each other. So you've got the Joneses and you've got the Smiths. And they live kind of close together. And everyone's checking each other out because they're going to have kids. Okay, so 
Mr. Smith likes the way that Mr. Jones raises his family. He likes his work, his work ethic. He likes the way he raises the older kids. He, um, they seem to have the same kind of morals and things. And they, and they would get together and be like, hey, I know. Let's just seal it up. <laughs> you have a son. I have a daughter. Let's just call it a day. Like, let's make it let's make a let's make a deal <laughs> and seal it and that was pretty common sometimes the kids were born sometimes they even weren't okay question um when did the heavenly father choose a bride for his son check it out listen to this blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. When did the father of the son choose a bride? Before you were born, before the earth was born, before the foundations of the world, he had already chose you to be the wife of his son. Isn't that amazing? That truly is like a mystery. Paul's like, listen up. It's not about earthly marriage. It's a billboard for something else. It is truly a mystery. Okay, so the father chooses a bride. God, knowing the beginning from the end, he can't help it. He's omniscient, okay? Just give him a break. People freak out about that. He knows the beginning from the end. It's okay. He had set Calvary's plan in action, in motion, before the foundation of the earth to redeem a bride for his son, and he picked you on purpose. Isn't that amazing? It's really, truly incredible. It really is. So the engagement of the bride to the son could last a long time. Sometimes the kids aren't even born, okay? It could be a while, depending on the age of the kids. And when the engagement happens, it could take a little bit while. It's a picker and wait. <laughs> game okay um but she is chosen okay but she's in waiting all right that's all that happens at the engagement period the father chooses the bride for the son so the next phase is what betrothal period okay what happens in the betrothal when the bride comes of age okay when she has her period is usually when that is. They have a big party. <laughs> you can now have babies. You're 12, okay? It's fine. Um, when she comes of age, whenever the fathers decide that that is for her, usually very young, 13, in that age, okay, the two families would meet at the bride's home. So, the Smiths and the Jones would get together at the Smiths house and several things would happen there in that meeting, that one meeting. So remember, we're in phase of the betrothal, right? Okay, first what happens is the proposal. She does get a proposal. The groom will formally ask the bride for her hand in marriage. He does do that. She does get asked by the guy, okay? Even though she had been predestined, pre-picked as the bride long before, perhaps even before she was born, she still has to say yes to the dress, okay? She has to agree. She has to make the decision and say yes to the groom. What about us? Even though we have been chosen before the foundation of the world, we must say yes to 
the marriage proposal of the bridegroom. You have to. The Lord does not force his love on anyone. You have to want to be the bride, you see. But he has purposed his heart to all. For God so loved the whole world. He gave his son for everybody. The marriage proposal stands for every soul. The blood covers all. It's a matter of whether you accept the proposal you see. God loves the whole world. He sent the, the son for everybody. His blood covers all, but we have to say yes. You see, and that's what makes you the bride. It's up to us. The proposal stands. Heaven stands. Salvation is a gift. It's there for the taking, but you have to say yes. All have a choice. We have a free will, you see. It's not an arranged marriage that we are kicking, dragging, screaming to. You have to say yes. Romans 10, 9 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. You will be the bride if you confess and believe. This proposal happens, she says yes. After she accepts the proposal, the dowry happens. Now again, in our Western culture, we do not have this. The bridal price is what we're talking about. You all know what a dowry is, kind of. I mean, it's so like not what we do over here. Um, but it's a bridal price that's set. How much is the bride worth? That's what the dowry says, okay? That's what it displays with whatever the dowry is it's laid out. Um, the fathers decide that. They come up with a price of how much the daughter is worth. It's, it's just so weird, okay? Um, we don't do that here, but it's super common over there in the Middle East, okay? The price for the bride was determined by two things. These are important. Write these down. Number one, the wealth of the groom's father, how much the groom's father has to be able to pay for the bride, right? And number two, the worth of the bride. So two factors, the wealth of the father, the worth of the bride. They come up with some bell curve, some spreadsheet based on how rich the, the son's father is, how much he can delve out. The groom's, the bride's father can't say, well, I think she's worth a million dollars and know that Mr. Smith can't pay a million dollars, okay? So it would be equal to whatever their social status is and then however much the bride is worth. The bride's worth, I'm just throwing this out there, would, would go up and down depending on does the bride's father have sons that can help at home? How much does she contribute? If I lose a workhorse, because that's everybody worked really hard over there. So if you only had a daughter with no sons, you're losing someone that's helping out and all that. And so that jacks her price up because she's worth more at home. You're losing some an employee pretty much, okay? So these kinds of things would equal out and determine, and they'd come up with some sort of number <laughs> or goats or whatever it was, okay? So number one, it was determined by the wealth of the father, the, the groom's father. Question, how wealthy is God the father? That shoots that bell curve up pretty high, right? Okay, the wealth of the father. Psalm 50 verse 10 says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know what else he owns? The hills. He also made the grass, okay? He made the cattle. I mean, how rich is God? 
okay? So that's one thing to think about is that he is infinitely wealthy. He has need of nothing, okay? Number two, the worth of the bride. Uh-oh. That takes the bell curve down, right? Okay, here's God the Father and me, okay? The worth of the bride. Um, question, how we see our worth versus the Father and how he sees our worth. Do those match? What worth did the heavenly Father put on you? What price did he pay to pay your dowry? What price? What were you worth to him? Yeah. The heavenly Father paid to redeem you with the shed blood of his only son. That is a high Price, and that's what you're worth to him. I will set the dowry for her, and I'm going to set it at the price, at the slaughter of my son. That's how much she's worth to me. Peter, First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 says this, knowing that you were ransomed or redeemed or bought back, dowry, from your futile ways inherited from your forefathers, you're bought out of your father's house, your earthly house, not with perishable things like gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That's what he paid for you. That's huge, you guys. Your dowry is priceless. You were bought, redeemed, purchased by the blood of the land. You were the prize on the other side of Calvary. You were the joy set before him, Hebrews tells us. You were. Your worth is acquainted to the price the Father was willing to pay to obtain you. That's how much you're worth to him to seal you, to snatch you, to guarantee you for his son. That is a high dowry. The father whose worth is unmeasured, absolutely unmeasured, chose to purchase you with something that would cost him greatly. Something he had only one of that he would actually feel the loss of it. Cattle, gold, silver, it's just pocket change to him. The son is not. He has one of them. And that's what he chose to buy you with. That is amazing. The dowry is high, you see. Okay, so there's the proposal. She accepted. The dowry is set. Then they make covenant together. The bride and the groom, these kids probably, at least she is, uh, they make covenant together. So this legal court document is drawn up. They read it and they sign it before the witness of the family. Remember, they're still sitting in the bride's house. All this has taken place. This is equivalent to like our marriage license, okay, just paperwork. After all this paperwork is signed and sealed, the bride and the groom-to-be would seal the documents by sharing a cup of wine between them. One cup of wine. The two, right there, would recite and repeat this vow. This is from ancient first century Jewish documents. Check this out. This is what they'd say. They would each share a cup of wine and say, By this thou art set apart to me according to the laws of Moses and Israel. They would say. Then the groom himself would add an extra line to the bride and say, I will not drink again until you. Does that sound familiar? It should. We're going to go there in a minute. So that 
vow was made while they had the wine together, and that's what they would say. Question, does this match us? Yeah, check it out. Remember the night of Jesus' betrayal? Remember that? Just hours before the Garden of Gethsemane, he was in an upper room with his disciples, and he was having a meal. He's sharing a meal with them. It was so important that they had to do it by stealth. They were sneaking around so people wouldn't find them. And at that meal, they shared a cup between them. Remember that? And Jesus said this, in Mark chapter 14, verse 24 and 25, listen to this. Jesus, the bridegroom, says, This is my blood of the covenant. Sound familiar? We are at the covenant of the betrothal, right? This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for, mer for many. Truly, I say to you, check it out. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Or you can put in parentheses, until I drink it again with you. I will not drink again until I drink with you. That's what he said in the upper room. This is my covenant. And I will not drink again until I drink with you. This is crazy. Okay, side note about the covenant. The signing of this covenant, this contract, this legal document, this thing that they're signing was a binding document. It's a binding legal event. To get out of the betrothal at this point, right now, once this document is signed, was the same as filing for divorce. It was as binding as if they were at the wedding part. Once they got here, she could have bailed at any other time, but as soon as those documents are signed, it's done. They are legally married. Even though the couple is not actually married, they have not consummated the marriage, none of that has happened, the betrothal contract stands as if they were. It's the same. Do you remember a young couple in Nazareth who found themselves stuck at this point in their betrothal phase of marriage and could not get out of it? Anybody? Nazareth, young couple. Mary and Joseph, they had got this far. They had legal binding documents. They were betrothed. And you'll see that in the gospel accounts that they were betrothed to get married. Mary and Joseph. Mary finds out from an angel that she is pregnant and they're screwed. Okay? To be pregnant out of wedlock was damnable by stoning to death for the woman. So Joseph finds out she's pregnant. And remember what he said? He was going to try to figure out a way to quietly divorce her, set her aside in a way that would protect her and preserve her life because he knew she'd probably get stoned. The reason why he would have to do that is because they are legally married even though they were not married yet you see and then the angel comes to joseph and he says it's fine roll with it you know she's telling the truth just go with it right and he's stuck by her side and they did not consummate the marriage until after jesus because mary had to be a virgin. that's right but they were legally betrothed so this point you can think mary and joseph okay the betrothal the covenant they were in waiting waiting to get married so the groom would then vow right there after they take this um they she accepts the proposal they figure out the dowry they sign contracts he pledges not to drink again until their wedding okay and then the groom, in front of everybody, 
promises to build her a chamber. Okay, that's the next part. To build her a chamber, that's what happens. A honeymoon suite, which would be an add-on to the father's house. I don't know if you know much about, again, uh, the Middle Eastern culture, but most houses were multi-generational. You had grandparents and great-grandparents and aunts and uncles and kids all living in the same house, and what they would do was add on rooms as the family grew. The older you were, the, the lower level that you had, and they usually built up, and then they had their living rooms on the top, right, on the roof. And so they would add on these rooms. Well, the groom would vow to build her a chamber, which was an add-on to the father's house, okay? Many rooms, multi-generational. So when the groom left the, the bride's house finally, he would immediately get to work. Carpentry skills are useful. Jesus was a... That's right. <laughs> I'm going to learn some tricks of the trade. Okay, uh, the groom then would work tirelessly on this chamber, this add-on to his father's house. Day and night he would work on this chamber because it was no ordinary place. Okay, the bridal chamber was posh. It was like the best hotel you've ever been to because it's where the bride would spend her seven-day honeymoon tucked away in that chamber at the father's house. Everything and anything she could possibly desire or want was stocked in that room. Fluffy pillows and spa treatments and chocolate and coffee, whatever, um, bubble baths, all this stuff was stocked into that room during the honeymoon, she's tucked away out of sight while the wedding is going on at the father's house right outside the door for seven days. The wedding happens at the father's house. The groom goes in and out. He welcomes the guests. He picks her up a to-go tray, whatever. Goes back in the chamber, does whatever they do. Comes back out, gets her more stuff. But she stays tucked away, you see. So the groom waited on her hand and foot. He was her butler, the only one that she saw for the seven days. And the groom wanted that room to be perfect. It was his first impression to the lady. <laughs> this was it. But the father demanded perfection. The father. If it was not done to the father's standards, then the groom could not stop working. The father is the one who would ride off on this add-on. The father had a standard and the son had to meet it. I was thinking about this with my son, which now is at the age if they were teens, that this would be taking place. Well, my son likes TV, frozen burritos, you know, and he's good. <laughs> he'd be like, it's done. Like, he's a teenage boy. You know what I mean? Like, he'd be like, some Mountain Dew, you know, the Xbox, frozen burritos, here you go, honey. And he'd say, it's done. If it was up to the groom... Who knows what she would get? Well, the fathers know that, so the guys couldn't get away with that. He's the one who made sure that it was something she could live in for seven days, you see. So the groom had no idea when the father's standards were met. Only when the father said, it's done, will he know that he's done working. He's just got to keep working on it until he says, um, does this match us? Yeah. Remember on the way from the upper room to the garden, Jesus is force feeding his last 
everything he's got into the disciples from chapter 14 through 17. Um, everything. I am the way. I am the truth. Um, I am the vine. Like everything. He's throwing everything in there. Well, in that narrative is John chapter 14 where Jesus says this. John chapter 14, 1 through 3. You will remember this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. What's he talking about? Add-ons. Chambers. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it was not so, would I have told you that I would go and prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Listen, I'm going to go take all my carpentry skills home. I'm going to start working on the Father's house, building all these rooms. I'm preparing a place for you, and when it's done, I'll come get you that we can be together. What's he talking about? This. This made sense to them. They knew what this meant. We're like, rooms? What? They get it, you see. So Jesus is like, I'm going to go do that. We just had the wine. I made a covenant. I told you I won't drink with you again. And I'm going to go and I'm going to start swinging some hammers, you see, in the Father's house. Uh, that is amazing. Now, the bride and groom, like I said, they live in these tiny little villages. And so she would walk by Mr. Smith's house a lot. Going to the well, going to the grocery store, seeing her girlfriends, what have you. They would walk by each other's house a lot. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody bumped into everybody. So while she's out and about, she would get to peek and see how it's coming along. Oh, it's framed. Oh, there's a roof, sort of. Oh, that's a better roof. Dad must have come by. Yo, know, oh, I'm seeing some furniture loaded in and stuff like that. Um, she can read the times and seasons and not know the day or the hour. She could see it approaching. The day approaching. She could see it. But only the father knew when the wedding was going to happen because he's the one who says, go. You see, not even the son knows. Does that ring a bell? Check this out. Matthew 24, 36. But concerning the day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the son only the father <laughs> isn't that cool only the father knows i'm working on it trust me i'm working on it as fast as i can but only the father knows okay meanwhile after the covenant is signed and the honey begins work on this chamber the groom the bride then from that day on is veiled she is now a bride in waiting and the tell of that is a veil when she goes out in public okay again middle east this isn't weird for them it is for us not for them she would now be marked as a bride in waiting it would distinguish her from other girls now she is taken from that day on, anytime she went out in public, she had to wear a veil. Her beauty in that way was protected and guarded for the groom's eyes only until the wedding. She's now off the market, you see. Um, it was an outward sign of her commitment to the bridegroom. She said, yes. It was an announcement to all that she was taken and she's a lady in waiting. It would be equivalent to our engagement ring, right? We've got some sort of sign that something happened, you see. She was then, as the vow said, by this thou art set apart for me. 
according to the laws of Moses. Remember that? That's the vow that they had to say to each other. Set apart, consecrated, holy is the word for her groom. She is consecrated to her groom, but not yet consummated with her groom. She is consecrated, just not consummated. It's a not yet, but she is set apart. We too are a bride that has been spoken for, you see. We are taken. We are now, as the bride of Christ, to be consecrated, set apart, holy for our bridegroom, set apart for his glory and his purpose. That's the whole deal, right? Look at 1 Peter um, chapter 2, verse 9. Check this out. But you are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You are now a people, a peculiar people, the King James says, which I love. You're weird and consecrated and you're his that you would proclaim or display the excellencies of his glory. You see, we are consecrated. We are set apart as holy while we wait for the bridegroom to return. We are to live as if we belong to him. That's our whole job. As the bride of Christ, we represent our bridegroom to the world. Everything we do reflects on him. We represent him. Think of a bride in Nazareth, out partying, getting drunk, you know, sleeping around, sleeping in, like not, think about that. Everything she does reflects on him. She was to be consecrated, sober-minded, holy to represent him well. Everything we do reflects Jesus because we are legally bound together. We are one. We are the bride of the king. Think about that. That's not a fairy tale. That's just true. Now, we are betrothed, consecrated bride, and knowing the customs of her day, um, she would make sure that she was home at sundown. Every night she was home. She would go about her day doing, doing her things, but at sundown she would come home and she could take her veil off, but she would be home. Why? Because she knew, first century bride, that the groom always comes after nightfall. If he's going to come, he'll come at night. And she knows that. Because of that, she goes home. She lights her lamps. She makes sure her oil lamps are full. She's watching for the groom out the window. She anticipates that her groom could come at any time. That's why she had to be ready and home and sober, you see. It was her responsibility to watch for him even while she waited. That was her job. Now, she could have had the attitude of, I've got so much time. <laughs> He's a lazy construction worker. I have all this time. I have a year. I have at least six months. I can go do whatever I want. I'm going to be out past nighttime. I'm going to hang out with my girlfriends. I can party down. I can do whatever I want. I already belong to him anyway. He can't get out of it. I have my fire insurance. I'll just live however I want to. It doesn't matter. Bottles up, bride. She could do that. She could live that way. I've got all the time in the world. She could do that. But instead, we are called all over the word, a thousand places, to be sober-minded, to be ready to be alert, to be awake, to walk in the light, to forsake the dark. 
Watch carefully then how you walk, Paul said. Remember that? Living holy, consecrated lives until our bridegroom returns. That's our job. We're ambassadors, you see. Romans 13, 11 through 12 says this. Listen to this. Besides this, you know the time. You know it. That the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. You know that every morning we wake up, we are one day closer? Like, literally closer? That's what Paul's saying. Salvation is nearer to us today than it was yesterday. It'll be nearer tomorrow. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Walk in it. Bride is what Paul's saying. You're veiled. You're consecrated. You're betrothed to the king. Represent him well. That was her job. Okay, note. This, of course, is where we live. Right here. In this consecrated, veiled <laughs> reality where we go about our day representing the bridegroom right, but at night we are sober, our lamps are lit, and we're watching for Jesus, right? That's what we're doing. Uh, we are at this point in our betrothal on this, on this timeline of the Jewish wedding. This is us, sanctification, earth, waiting, 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 waiting. That's us. That's our reality watching and waiting, living for Jesus, which means the rest of what we talk about tonight is future forward, because this is as far as we've got, practically, right? Literally, this is it. We are in the betrothal period right now, veiled, consecrate, consecrated. We have accepted the proposal. The dowry of the blood of the lamb has been set. We have made covenant. We are under the blood covenant Jesus has vowed not to drink again until we see him. And we are veiled, waiting for the Lord. So this is it, which means from now on, we are in sneak peek mode of what's coming up. You guys ready for that? <gasps> I am. So after the betrothal comes the wedding, the actual wedding, okay? The two of them had been waiting and waiting and waiting night after night until one night the father comes to the son and says, it's done. Put a bow on it. The, the room is ready. Go get her. That's what he says. Yippee! The groom is happy. Do you know that Jesus is waiting to come get you? He is. He's as anxious, probably more anxious because he's glorified and stuff, than we are. He's ready. He's just waiting for the Father. So he says, yippee, I can go get her. So this is what happens. The groom calls all his dudes, all the groomsmen, okay? He calls all his guys, all his friends. They grab every cymbal and drum and noisemaker, everything that they can find, chauffeurs, that make sense? Trumpets, the chauffeurs, banners, flags, everything they can and for a parade. And they leave the father's house with, I mean, just noise, ruckus, lights, shouting, celebration, everything they got. The groom and his guys. And they leave the father's house and they weave through the streets. Now, these are tiny little villages for the most part. So he would take the back roads, the alleys, he'd loop back around like in a circle. He'd kind of take a meandering way to give the, the bride some time, okay? Because what happens is that's all the time she gets. So check out this verse, Matthew 25, 6. But at midnight, there was a cry. I love this verse. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Ha! At midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. That's exactly what's going on. So check this out. Meanwhile, the bride is at home, hopefully. She's not out partying. You see how she can get caught? 
if she's not watching and waiting. She's at home. She's got her little oil lamp. She's watching out the window. She's dutifully waiting and waiting and waiting. And then there's this sound coming in the distance. And she hears cymbals and tambourines and shouting and trumpets in the street. And her bridemaids say, he's coming. And they freak out the whole house. And they fluff her up and they throw a dress on her and they shove her out the door and then her and her bridesmaids meander through the street to meet him you see she's got her lipstick on her hair is all fluffed out whatever her dress is on backwards whatever she's out the door with her girls with their oil lamps remember the 10 versions okay with their oil lamps weaving through the street to meet her groom she leaves her father's home he leaves his father's home and they meet in the middle hello in the middle you see she leaves her earthly dwelling he leaves his father's house and they meet not in his house not in her house right in the middle. Does that ring a bell? Okay, check this out. We've read this verse a thousand times, but check it out in the context of the wedding. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven or leave his father's house, right? With a cry, celebration, a parade, noisemakers, cymbals, all this stuff, trumpets, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet, then those who are alive and left will be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. And we will always be with the Lord. He leaves heaven with shouts and, and cries. We leave earth and meet him in the middle. It's the rapture of the church. You see, he doesn't come all the way here. We don't meet him there. We meet in the middle and then he takes us back to the Father's house, right? Okay, so right in the middle, though, before they go back to the Father's house, in the middle of the street, just right there, they exchange wedding vows, they exchange gifts. He can't even hardly stand it, okay? All that happens right in the middle of the street and all this music starts and all this celebration starts and Revelation chapter 4 says that we are immediately swept into this worship service of celebration and it's happy and it's musical and it's celebratory and dancing and worship happens at the Bema seat and we all get our wedding gifts and all that happens immediately I was in the spirit, John says. And all this celebration is going on. That's exactly what happens in the traditions, you see. Jesus, the bridegroom, at the center of it all, you see. And it's beautiful, and it's intimate, and it's awesome. Right away. And after the wedding, after this self, the exchanging of vows and wedding gifts and all the party is escorting them back to the father's house and all this happened, then the honeymoon starts, okay? Then it's the honeymoon. So the wedding party, the friends, the family would escort the couple back to that bridal chamber that he had been working so hard on right? They deposit them into the bridal chamber and there they would consummate the marriage and she specifically, especially, would be tucked away in that chamber for, anybody know? Seven days. A Jewish wedding is seven days long. Does that ring a bell? Seven, seven, right? Okay, so their marriage then goes from consecrated to consummated. And then the seven-year honeymoon begins. She, the bride, does not come out for the seven days. But the groom, like we said, goes in and out. He waits on her. He's got other stuff that he does. He checks in with the wedding guests, all this stuff. Us, it's bliss, it's intimacy, it's rest. <laughs> and romance with the bridegroom for seven years. 
How that pans out, what that looks like, I have no idea, but that is what we have to look forward to. In a mysterious way, Paul says, it's the same. Nobody can figure it out. But I'm telling you that earthly marriage, Paul says, was given to you that you would see what it would be like so that you would have something tangible to sink your teeth into to figure it out. But it's still a mystery. The church and Jesus, you see. We will be happy, you guys, satisfied, full of joy, glorified in our glorified bodies we talked about last week, in our new homes. All that's going on with the other saints, with the full bride of Christ together in this honeymoon with no barriers between us. Not only between the bride, but between the bride and the bridegroom. It is naked, it is open, it is unashamed. We will be presented to him blameless and pure, Ephesians 5 says. Whoa. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, turn to Revelation 19. You didn't think we'd do Revelation tonight, huh? <gasps> we are, because I want to show you something. Revelation 19. At the end of seven days, in a Jewish wedding, what happens is the groom goes into the chamber, gets the bride, and brings her out. And she is presented before the wedding guests of, here comes the bride. Okay, that's what would happen. And then they would sit down and they'd have this really fancy dinner. And then the wedding was over and everybody went back to the fields. <laughs> that's it. Honeymoon's over. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Um, and that's what happened. Okay, check out Revelation 19 verse 6. Check this out. Then I heard, John says, what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder listen all of heaven starts cheering and yelling and shouting why check it out hallelujah for the lord our god the almighty reigns let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. In the King James, this says, his wife has made herself ready. His wife. Here comes the bride. That's what this is. She comes out of her chamber and heaven goes ballistic. And they say, hallelujah, it's the bride and the bridegroom and they're together and she's like clean and stuff. It's like a miracle. Do you know that the gospel is absolutely confounding to the angels? The word says that. These are things that the angels long to look into. They just cannot figure it out, Hebrews says. It just doesn't make any sense. But here she is. Here comes the bride. And heaven goes crazy, you see. She comes out of heaven and she's presented with the lamb. The thunderous applause. And you are presented on the arm of your husbandman, the king of kings. You are. And heaven goes nuts. Wild. Jesus brings you out with so much pride and so much joy on his face and heaven goes crazy because you're there. It's him and it's her and the plan. It worked out. You see, this crazy plan, it worked out. They're together. It's a mystery. Here she is. They're together. And he is standing in all his majesty and you are in the presence of his majesty and you are in your white wedding dress, flawless and beautiful and bright and pure and perfect. Amazing. 
and you then will be given a place of honor at the table at the marriage feast of the lamb or the wedding feast. So in the Jewish wedding, she at the end of seven days is presented and they sit in a place of honor together and they have this meal. Same with at heaven. This is when the marriage feast of the lamb happens, chronologically even, at the end of the seven years, at the end even of the tribulation. The second half of chapter 19 is Armageddon. We are at the end, you see. So it happens right at the end. There will be food without calories. Yes. Joy without tears. Dancing without joint pain. It's going to be amazing. And we together at that feast will drink of the cup that he swore not to drink until we were together. And we will be together forever. You know what I love about the first miracle? Not only did it take place at a wedding, but what was his miracle specifically? The wine. You know how important wine is at a Jewish wedding? It is more than just wine. It was symbolic for the bride and groom. They have to drink wine at the wedding. That was the whole thing. I will not drink again until you... You see, and here they run out. When? On day one. They had seven days left. They're like, listen, the bride's not even here yet. We're totally out of wine. And Mary's like, help me. Remember that? It was a big deal. And not only was it a big deal culturally, but Jesus thought it was a big deal. Do you know what he was thinking about? Can you imagine He's like, I'm going to do this with my boys in the upper room, and then I'm going to do it with my bride. You see, this is a big deal. And he chose to take that moment at a wedding with wine to be like, this is it. This is important enough to get the ball rolling. I think that's amazing. I really do. Listen, this is true. It's really going to happen to us. It's not a fairy tale. It's not Disney. It's really true. It's just absolutely mind boggling. It still feels like a fuzzy kind of storyline. It's true. And if the rapture happens tonight, you're talking like seven years from now on our timeline. It's coming up. This marriage feast of the land. It seems outrageous. It seems otherworldly because it's just so incredible. It's fanciful. Um, we can't really wrap our minds around it. But it's true. One day, your groom will split the sky with trumpets and shouting to call you up to him. To exchange vows with you right there in the clouds. To give you wedding gifts to whisk you away to a bridal chamber. It really is going to happen. Can you imagine the bridal chamber he's making for you? Just for you? I have put in so many orders, and then I changed my mind. And I'm like, wait, I have a better idea. He's like, please. He is going to sweep you off your feet and tuck you away in bliss. It is true. And you will be exceedingly joyful. Not the fake kind, the real kind. Lacking absolutely nothing with a groom that is perfect. That's crazy. And to see Jesus without any barriers between us of sin or shame or ick is crazy. To face him without any fear or wanting to hide our eyes. And he will serve you. And you will be well loved. I cannot wait for that day. I see hope coming on the horizon. There's no need for hiding. Because I belong. of the great I am.
near to your heart, oh God, I have found my joy. I've searched so long, in darkness I've walked so far, fighting but I'm holding on, when your love draws near, hallelujah. See you.